grace, the grace and peace of Christ be with you. Today, we celebrate the 24th Sunday after Pentecost, a time when the church learned that where their treasure lies, so also does their heart. My name is Jamie Orr, and I'm grateful to worship with you, church, on this day. Let us pause for a moment and be present in this space. Let us, in silence, reflect on the truth of how we feel in body and spirit in this moment. God has called us together today in worship. Let us give that call voice with our call to worship, and if you desire, you can rise as we repeat this responsively. Come, Holy Spirit, our hearts inspire by your presence. Let us be moved. Source of the old prophetic fire, fountain of life and love. Come, Holy Spirit, for moved by you, your prophets wrote, and spoke. Unlock the truth, yourself the key, unseal the sacred book. Expand your wings, celestial dove, brood over our nature's new birth. On our disordered spirits move, and let your life abound on earth. God, through your own self, we then shall know if you within us shine, and sound with all your saints below the the depths of love divine. The peace of the Lord be with you. And now let us share a sign of peace with each other by commenting on the live stream page, sending a text, or simply shouting peace to the world.
see you this morning. I'm uh, Pastor Amy. I'm glad to be here with you. What are your names? Ellie. Ellie and Noel. Ellie. Eleanor. Look here. <laughs> Eleanor and Atticus. Okay. Well, welcome. So I have a question for you. Did you ever put a coin in a wishing well? Yes. You did. Did you I get your wish? Um, sort of. Sort of? All right. I like it. Um, so I have a story. I was in um, Italy a couple of weeks ago, and I was studying and learning about the life of a man called St. Francis. And he, in his life, um, put a lot of energy and effort into helping people who were poor and to sharing a message of good news and telling people to live new lives. And part of that was that he gave up all of his worldly possessions and just relied on people giving him the things he needed every day. And we went to one of the churches where they remembered his life. And in this one, they remembered that he was um, put in prison for a little while. His dad didn't want him to give everything up, and so he kind of put him in a closet for a while. It wasn't a good situation. So they had a, a kind of like a reenactment of that. And when I went to that church, I saw um, that a lot of people had kind of put money into that little cell like it was a wishing well, which I thought was very funny since it's Francis who gave up everything to follow Jesus. Um, so the story, uh, the scripture that we're going to hear, one of the scriptures we're going to hear today is from Jesus, and he tells his disciples, don't store up treasure here on earth, store it up in heaven, because where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. I got help. <laughs> Do you need He's some help here? Me. Hey, Atticus, can you, uh, can you climb down, buddy? Yeah. <laughs> All right, nice work. Um, what do you what do you think when you hear that? What does that say to um, you? What I think is I go back cool up. is like you need to <laughs> you wait <laughs> on occasion. Um, I'm not getting it. I don't want to know. Right. Great. Thank you. <laughs> What's something that you treasure, Atticus? What's something? Uh, he treasures his um, boo. You want to know what that is? His boo? Yeah. Bubba, sit. What is your boo? <laughs> He's going to go get it. Yeah. He knows what it is. It's his tablet. His tablet. He, yes. I also used I was, that tablet, although I dropped it in water and it broke. Oh, no. <laughs> I was going to say, my daughter and I very much treasured this phone together for a long time. Yeah. Now she has her own. Is it too good? Well, um, baby. Not a good idea. All right. He's going back. Well, Eleanor, thank you. Um, so what could it look like to uh, give some of our treasure to God, to heaven? What would that look like? Maybe we give a gift somewhere? I used to hear like the 18th time, they would go, they would have like a pool of water. And they would like burn the new things they found so they could give like stuff to God. Give stuff to God by burning it in lava. All right. Uh, kind of like how that weird lemur did in Madagascar. <laughs> oh, in Madagascar, the lemur throws something in the lava? Yeah. <laughs> nice. Well, I think that one way we can share our treasure and make sure that our hearts are towards God is by giving gifts to people who are in need and to um, caring for God's creation. So that might be our gifts of our energy and our excitement and our love. It might be gifts of our money, if we've got money. Um, this is the thing that I care for. You, this is who you care for as Atticus. That's so beautiful. All right, well, let's say a prayer. 
Gracious God, help us to um, treasure and give thanks for all the gifts you give us and help us to put our hearts in the right places by putting our treasure there. We pray this in Jesus' name, and we pray together the prayer Jesus taught to his disciples, saying, Our Father and our Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Eleanor and Atticus. I invite you to pray with me. Let us pray. Holy God, let your spirit come and dwell among us here and dwell among us wherever we may be scattered physically. We pray that this community would feel your spirit's presence and be moved by it, that we would know the plans that you have for our lives and the places where our hearts can be most tended to and grow strong and brave. We pray these things, trusting always in your grace. Amen. Okay. I invite you to join me in the prayer of confession and assurance of pardon. Trusting in God's forgiveness, let us in silence confess our failings and acknowledge our part in the pain of the world. Before God, with the people of God, I confess to turning away from God in the ways that I wound my life the lives of others, and the life of the world. May God forgive you, Christ renew you, and the Spirit enable you to grow in love. Amen. Before God, with the people of God, we confess to turning away from God in the ways we wound our lives, the lives of others, and the life of the world. May God forgive you, Christ renew you, and the Spirit enable you to grow in love. Amen. Amen. Listen now in the reading of Scripture for the word and wisdom of God. The Old Testament reading is from the book of Ruth, the third chapter, five verses 1 through 5, and chapter 4, verses 13 and 17. A brief synopsis of plot so far. Naomi has left Israel, Judah, with her two sons and gone to Moab, where her sons each married. One of them married Ruth. Naomi's husband and the two sons die over the, as the years go by. They return, Naomi returns to Judah, and Ruth goes with her to care for her. Ruth works in the fields of, of uh, one of their, one of Naomi's relatives, Boaz. And that's where the reading today picks up. Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to Ruth, my daughter, why shouldn't I seek security for you so that things might go well for you? Now, isn't Boaz, whose young women you are with, our relative? Tonight he will be winnowing barley at the threshing floor. You should, you should bathe, put on some perfume, 
wear nice clothes, and then go down to the threshing floor. Don't make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, notice the place where he is lying. Then go, uncover his feet, and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. Ruth replied to Naomi, I will do everything you are telling me. Soon after, Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When they came together, the Lord made Ruth conceive, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without some next of kin, and may his name be renowned in Israel. This ends the Old Testament lesson. Our gospel lesson comes from Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 21. Stop collecting treasures for your own benefit on earth, where moth and rust eat them, and where thieves break in and steal them. Instead, collect treasures for yourselves in heaven, where moth and rust don't eat them, and where thieves don't break in and steal them. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. I'm Martin Smith. Before I start my testimony of faith, I want to take a moment in my role as a member of the reentry committee to advise you about some changes that we are making in our worship and also for outdoor activities of our children effective today, November the 7th. So all these changes are effective today. So our first change is that we are going to uh, decrease the distance between congregation members to three feet from six feet and family units may sit next to each other with a distance between three feet between non-family unit members. As of today, mask wearing guidelines are as follows. Everybody above the age of two years should wear a mask in the sanctuary. The ministers, the liturgists, and other designated worship team members may remove their mask while speaking to the congregation. Effective today, for the children when they are, uh, and adults when they are outside the church building, children playing outdoors in the playground or participating in supervised outdoor church activities are not required to wear masks subject to the permission of their parents. <laughs> 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 and
and adults and children may remove their masks to speak to others while outdoors on the church grounds. Today, one of our big changes is this. Congregation members may sing hymns and musical responses during the worship service. As per the, yes, as per the mask wearing guidelines, all participants must be masked when singing. The second is a little more complicated, but we want to share this with you, and we are working our way through this as we're going to discuss. Prior to the COVID-19 outbreak, we made a church decision to discontinue the use of the two hymn books that we had in the pews. Both books were over 20 years old. We needed to find a more updated hymnal to work with. After reviewing what was out there, the selection by the church was the Glory to God uh, Presbyterian Hymnal, which is the official hymnal for the Presbyterian Church. In our original planning, we had hoped to put video screens around the church for the congregation to view the hymns so we would not have to go and purchase hymnals. At this point, we are not there yet where we can go ahead and do that work. So what has been happening? The hymns that you are hearing in the service, with a few exceptions that have been uh, out there, uh, and probably we, we hope from the uh, further will not be happening again because there was some miscommunication between some of our guest pastors about music. All of our music is coming out of the Glory to God Presbyterian hymnal. We do have the official licenses to print th th this music. So what we want to be careful of though is we don't want to run up our copying costs by having to add that to the worship bulletin. So a lot of this is going to depend on attendance. We're going to work our way through this the best we can. The hymns are attached, if you are reading to what's happening, they are attached on Friday. If you can print your copies and bring them in, that's fine. We will have copies available here on Sundays on a limited basis. But this is something we don't, as you can understand, we don't want to go out and buy the hymnal book copies and then eventually, you know, we've expended funds that we don't want to expend looking at our long range plans. So we will work our way through this. And last but not least, as of today, the cushions have been reinstalled in our pews. <laughs> All right, having said that, I'm going to move on to my testimony of faith on stewardship. So I'm breaking this down into four different parts. The first part I'm going to talk about is my early memories of stewardship. I'm going back to the year 1959, where I was very young. In 1957, our family had moved up to Long Island and we were attending the closest Catholic church in the nearby town of Smithtown. In 1959, due to the growth on Long Island, the Vatican took some steps and said, you know, we can no longer manage the amount of population that's moved to Long Island with the setup. At that point, the archdiocese controlling all of Long Island was Brooklyn. They said, we got to split this up, too many people. So they established a new archdiocese for Nassau, Suffolk County, the two counties outside of the New York City boundaries, and set that bishop up in Rockville Center, Long Island. As one of the bishop's first actions, he decided to establish a new parish in the area which encompassed where our family was residing. The new parish had 2,300 people. No church, no rectory know nothing and the bishop said form a new church build a new church get this done so off we went to get this done so our first problem is where were we going to hold masses for all these people the only building large enough in the community area where all these 2,300 people were was the local movie theater I'm passing around pictures now I'm didn't find this, unfortunately, until yesterday. I'll try and get it into what's happening next week. But it shows them gathered out front of the movie theater and having to run masses you know, several times on Sundays to accommodate 2,300 worshipers. <laughs> so if you think we have problems <laughs> trying accommodating 2,300 people and having to use a mere movie theater. So we move on to the issue of how this relates to stewardship. So we had to get a new church building up and we had to get it up quickly. The new bishop told us we had to come up with 25% of the funds and cash or pledges before we could start building. 
this was actually an improvement over the Brooklyn Archbishop who had told co new congregations they had to have 50% on hand in pledges and cash before they could put up a new church. So my father volunteered to be one of the persons working on the pledge campaign, which was interesting because of the fact he had converted to Catholicism when he married my mother. And to the complete surprise of the church leadership, he ended up getting the highest number of pledges and donations and got a personal audience with the bishop for his work. <laughs> so here he was, the convert, and you know he's the guy who comes up with the most pledges. So I'm gonna move forward to after Joyce and I were married in the early 1990s, we were attending on weekends in Southern Maryland because her mother had a second house down there at the Methodist Church down on Solomon's Island. They had hit a point where they needed a building renovation. The uh, main church was built in the 18, late 1800s and they wanted to replace their fellowship hall. The fellowship hall had an interesting story because it was basically cobbled together by the men of the church after World War II and how this was done. Several of them were employees of uh, the local military bases, civilians. So as they started tearing down temporary buildings, they started cart carting off the remains of these buildings and ended up <laughs> putting up the, the fellowship hall out of the remains <laughs> of, the, of these um, World War II buildings. So when they started the renovation, one of the interesting things, there was an old story that when they connected the fellowship hall to the church, there was a large tree in between and they, when they cut down the tree, the men decided that they weren't going to completely tear the stump out because it was too much work. So the entranceway from the church into the fellowship hall was on a ramp. So sure enough, when they finally started the reconstruction for the new fellowship hall and they tore down the building, the tree was there. <laughs> the, the, the word was true on that. So. Then the next couple of things relate to the famous um, hymn on Christ the Solid Rock, I Stand. The church being built <coughs> in the 1880s, the men in that time that built the church didn't put it on a particularly solid foundation. So we're down there on Solomon's Island and the building engineer, of course, when they wanted to do the renovation said, you know, we gotta get a more solid foundation on this. So he said, let's drive, you know, we had to drive pilings the estimate for the pilings was go down 16 feet to hit rock. Well, three of them went down 16 feet fine. The fourth one, they had to keep going to 31 feet. <laughs> so it's interesting that the church building had managed, you know, from the 1880s to stay up <laughs> under the circumstances. The other interesting thing <clears throat> that, that uh, related to rock was they had a seawall that had fallen apart behind the church building. And that was going to be a considerable expense to put up. So the church leadership went up to the Calvert County government and said, is there some way you know, the county can help us out? Well, the county came back and said, well, we looked into us and legally <clears throat> we can't give money to churches. But one of the county uh, government staff people said, wait a minute, I think there's a way that we can help out. It turned out the state had a program that instead of building the old style concrete sea walls, as you may have seen, they now use these huge rock jetties. Well, through the state, the state came in, built the rock jetty in place of the seawall, and we fortunately, which helped offset driving the 31 feet down from the piling, which was an unbudgeted cost, they got the sea rock wall put in with a no interest loan to the church for 25 years. So things work out when you deal with Christ and the rock, don't they? The last um, thing I'd like to share before I move on to how we're going to work with stewardship uh, this year with the church. Uh, one of the local Methodist churches that Joyce and I attended before coming here was having a conversation in their finance committee about some uh, emergency building repairs. One of the members who was present was a local business owner, said, well, I know that you need these repairs, but we don't have any money in the budget, so how are we gonna pay for this? The church treasurer looks at him and says the following, we're going to get the money from you and the bank. <laughs> so, 
So here we are looking at our stewardship campaign for this year. So I have some suggestions of some things that you know, we're going to have to you know, be working on as we do this. And I'm gonna kind of go through this process and hopefully you know, this will make sense to everybody here. First, I think we need to pray and give thanks for all that our church has been able to accomplish during the COVID epidemic and the pastoral transition process. So we've had two tough things to go through. We need to thank our church leadership for the exceptional work they've been doing in planning for our future as a church, especially our moderator, Kathy McFadden, who's here this morning, praise God. <laughs> yes, indeed. We also have a need for uh, people to volunteer their time and talent in support of our internal church ministries, including the children's Sunday school, assisting with Sunday morning worship services, and participating in our church music programs. So we would appreciate more volunteers from our church family. If we wish to continue the exceptional outreach ministries we're doing with the community, we need to focus on how these ministries can help us develop strategies to recruit new members for our church. Presently, our monthly collections are still at summertime levels and have not returned to their normal fall levels. We hope our members and friends who are away for the summer will be able to catch up on their financial support to our church over the next few weeks. We will not have our final 2022 budget until it's approved by the annual church meeting next year. The council and the trustees are spending considerable time formulating a proposed budget that continues to fund our present needs and supports opportunities for growth and expansion but we need your spiritual support and your financial gifts to make this possible. You can find our 2022 pledge forms and talent commitment cards on our church website. Please contact the church office if you need assistance in submitting your pledge and talent forms by mail or need help setting up online financial deductions for your gifts to the United Church of Christ of Annapolis. A letter from our stewardship team will be mailed to our members and friends within the next few weeks. In addition, the stewardship team will be doing additional contacts with members. We will be contacting by text and email to first see when a good time is to contact our members, and we will be happy to talk to people through personal phone calls or here at church or whenever is convenient if you have any questions about our stewardship process. Some good news, as of last Wednesday, three of our families have already submitted their pledge for 2022. Joyce and I were one of the three families, and after prayerful consideration, we made a significant increase in our pledge. We hope others who are able can do the same. If you have any questions regarding our stewardship campaign, please contact any member of the stewardship team. The members are Margaret Fox, Rick Dubb, Kathy Sanders, and myself, Martin Smith. Thank you for listening. Gracious God, let your spirit be present here now, in this place, in this time, and across the airwaves. We pray that you will bless us, that the words that I speak will be a blessing to you, and that the meditations of our hearts will draw us closer to you and to your vision for the world. We pray these things trusting in your grace. Amen. So the book of Ruth is full of meaningful names. Ruth, for example, means friend. Her mother-in-law's name, Naomi, means pleasant one or beauty. Is the sound, is it doing okay? Okay. All right. Um, Naomi means pleasant one or beauty. But when Naomi's husband, Elimelech, his name means God is king, uh, when, his husband, when her husband dies while they're living in a foreign country, 
Naomi's fortunes begin to shift. After her sons, Malon, whose name means sickness, and Chilion, whose name means wasting, also die, as might be expected from their names, she feels bereft, like her entire life work is destroyed in a certain way. Um, but really just the grieving of her children and her whole family. And she feels like, I can't even start over now. She's too old. So she starts walking home to Bethlehem with what is left of her family, her two daughters-in-law, Ruth and Orpah. But not too far along the journey, Naomi just can't stomach the thought of dragging her daughters-in-law into this life that she has to return to, this uh, kind of an outcast fate. So she tries to send them back to their families of or origin. Orpah whose, name, Orpah, whose name means fawn, or more evocatively, neck, turns her neck back to her family after some persuasion from Naomi. It doesn't take her too long. Ruth, on the other hand, refuses to leave. She swears vows and calls down curses on herself if anything should separate her from Naomi, even death. So Naomi gives up trying to convince her, and the two of them make their way to Bethlehem. Naomi has been gone for at least 10 years, waiting out the famine in Moab, so when the village women come around to find out what she's been up to, she tells them, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara instead. My life has been very bitter since I've been gone. Mara means bitter. After all, she has lost her husband and both her sons, and she's returning in a very weak and vulnerable state. But then Ruth starts doing what she has to do to take care of them, this little two-person family unit. She goes out and collects the gleanings of the grain in a nearby field, taking what the harvesters leave behind intentionally for the poor and the needy. It just so happens that the owner of that field is a man named Boaz, which means strength, and he tells his people to pull out a little extra grain for her, let her drink the water from their jars, protect her from anyone who might try to attack her. He sees what Ruth is doing for Naomi, and he respects it and responds in generosity. He's a mensch. Naomi learns about this, and as it so happens, Boaz is related to her husband, and so he may have a right slash obligation to marry Ruth so that she won't have to keep living the hard widow lifestyle of gleaning after the harvesters. A spark lights up in Naomi again. She sees a path now that she hadn't seen on the road back to Jerusalem. She works out a risky scheme for Ruth to really force the matter. Go to the threshing floor, she tells Ruth, after Boaz is settling to sleep, and uncover his feet and tell him you want him to do his duty and take you as his wife. And in case we're not clear, this is pretty bold behavior on Ruth's part. And if anyone sees her, her reputation is shot. But nobody sees. And Boaz knows how to work through the bureaucracy involved. And more importantly, he wants Ruth to be his wife. He sees and respects her. And the end of the story is that Ruth, a foreigner, a daughter-in-law, turns out to be better for Naomi than seven of her own sons. The son Ruth bears becomes Naomi's son, and he goes on to be the grandfather of King David. This week in Glasgow, Scotland, the United Nations has been holding a climate summit, a follow-up to the one in Paris in 2015 and the Kyoto Agreements before that. The track record for these meetings so far has been fair to middling. 
U the U.S. and China, currently the two biggest emitters of greenhouse gases, each have their own internal reasons for not wanting to cut back on fossil fuels. Nobody really wants to, to have to take the actions required, except that there are thousands and millions of people in developing countries who are experiencing climate change now and not just in the form of rainier summers and 70 degree November days. Floods, droughts, monsoons, hurricanes, more common, more powerful because of climate change. And it's not like we're, see we're not seeing some of that here in the US. The drought and the fires and wild, uh, wildfires in California turned our skies orange this year. And Superstorm Sandy is less than 10 years ago. But the difference is for us, we have the money, the flexibility, the resources as a nation to adjust, to recover, to make things new. For people whose islands are disappearing, for subsistence farmers whose farmland is turning to desert or getting too much water or too much heat, those options aren't always available climate emergency is here. And I feel, my, I feel myself being in Naomi's shoes as she walks into Bethlehem. I already know this place. I know what can happen here. And I know what we are losing and what we will lose soon with no way of preventing it. It feels like there are no surprises. We've come up against a very tough challenge as humans or maybe as Westerners, each of us is struggling and hoping for just a little bit more, even a lot more for some of us, and hoping someone else will take a little less. And the global scale of what we're looking at is also hard for some of us to grasp, the slow pace of a climate, which makes it that much harder to mobilize for. Now that we're finally experiencing some of the effects, people are starting to pay attention. But the time to act really was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 40 years ago. And many of our neighbors aren't convinced yet that we need to act now. And there is a lot of power in the hands of people who are making a profit off of the current system. The people most able to insulate themselves from the effects of climate change seem to be the ones with the most power to slow it down, or not, as they choose. It is bitter to watch this happening. But then I remember that in addition to the big players who we really do need to take action and to change the structures and the rules so that we can make progress, but in addition to them, there are also all the rest of us doing our part. I see there, I know there's many ways you have taken the environment into account here at UCC of Annapolis. You just walk in the door and know that the electricity bills here pay for windmills bringing down energy from heaven. I'm sure I'm not the only person here who composts. Anybody, can I get a witness? Are there any composters? All right, here we go. Uh, I'm guessing there possibly is a bicyclist or two in the room who gets by without too much car driving. Some vegetarians, perhaps. Maybe somebody who owns a hybrid or an electrical vehicle. And on a bigger scale, even when the U.S. pulled out of the Paris Agreement, there were still states and companies that worked to abide by them. There is a lot of work happening to address climate change. And those immediate actions are important. And the next step of it, the work that uh, UCC of Annapolis here has done, for example, with ACT, building power, building a collective voice, working to advocate for justice, that makes a difference too. Because in the face of all the organized money keeping climate change rolling along, we have got to keep organizing people. Naomi became Mara when she first got back to Bethlehem because she didn't see a future for herself or for Ruth. 
But Ruth started doing the next thing that she knew to do. And that began a chain reaction that led to a new life for both of them. On Saturday in Glasgow, Jesus showed up in the form of 100,000 young people rallying for real reforms to climate change. With a sense of joy and determination, they spoke out for the kinds of decisions that would actually present, present, prevent the worst of climate change's effects. These young folks have taken their steps They've gone to the fields. Can we work with them to find a path to real and needed change? Can we add our influence? Can we add our experience to the mix? In the gospel lesson for today, Jesus says, wherever you put your treasure, that's where your heart will be too. My prayer is that we can find a way to put our hearts, our bodies, our treasure in the right place caring for each other by caring for God's creation. For all the efforts that have already been made, I give thanks. For the future that we don't know yet, but which may contain unexpected opportunities and a new chance at life, I pray. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Lo, praise Christ, all creatures near below. Praise Holy Spirit evermore, God in all three whom we adore. Amen. Please be seated. Friends, we share our prayers of hope and concern together now. Confident that God listens to our prayers and calls us together in response. We invite you to share these prayers now by raising your hand in the sanctuary and sharing them after being called upon, or by commenting on the YouTube page. And after each prayer, we will say, God, in your grace and mercy, hear our prayer. I'm sorry we didn't have announcements uh, earlier, so I, I would like to make an announcement that the Bible study has been moved to 8.30 instead of 8.45, because that allows some people to get to church and choir practice. So that is just an announcement. Thank you. Kathy. Um, gratitude, I actually drove for the second time today. My foot response is not real quick, but anyway, I feel mobile. I feel like I back, have some control back again in my life, and I am grateful to be back in church. For your continued healing, grace in your, God in your grace, hear our prayers. I have um, two, well, I have a prayer of gratitude. Uh, last week, I mentioned that my roommate and I, we were looking for a place, and we thankfully secured something. Uh, we start moving in, not this upcoming Monday, but the Monday uh, after that. So I'm very excited. And then also the link uh, to the concert that I had last Saturday is available. Um, Dr. Orr, I sent that to you. Okay, yes. So um, it, it will be a link from, it will say UMBC, uh, but yes. So if any of you would like to view that, it is available now. Thank you so much for your continued support. I appreciate all of you. In thanks, but also in gratitude for your gifts, God in your grace, hear our prayers. couple things. First, Rick Dove has his prayer of blessing of the warmth provided by the sun in these fall times. God, in your grace, hear our prayer. And we got a couple of personal requests. For me, I got results of my colonoscopy this week. I have a mass in my rectum. I don't know if it's cancer yet. I have to wait for the biopsy and also find a specialist who takes my insurance. God, in your mercy, hear mm -hmm. our prayers. And for Joan, her husband's taken a turn for the worse, and she's got some hard decisions to make. So prayers for her and for her husband. Mercy, hear our prayers. Um, I'd appreciate, uh, well, first of all, I have a prayer of gratitude and thanksgiving. My brother and his wife had twin babies this morning. And so... Uh, I'm excited and scared for them. <laughs> um, and so, but prayers for their, um, for a good transition home, for health for Teresa, um, prayers for uh, the babies. So God, in your grace and mercy, hear our prayers. Um, and I also would like to lift up prayers for my grandmother, who is very sick. And so we're just praying for her right now. So her name is Jerry. Um, God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. I'd like to take this opportunity to express my gratitude, and I'm sure many of you will join in this expression, 
this was a wonderful service this morning from our music group here, our choir, Kayla, Dr. Orr. We've uh, put together a good music program. We want to see it grow some more. We welcome anyone who would like to join us to come and be with us. God, in your grace, hear our prayers. Prayers of Thanksgiving. Um, my father came home last week from the hospital. His white blood cells are rising. His port's been removed. His platelets are good. Basically, everything is going very, very well. So thank you for your prayers. God, in your grace, hear our prayers. A prayer of hope and and help for Nora and Yasser that Nora might find a helpful job, a small job, and that Yasser can find a better job. It, the family depends on it, and um, they're wonderful, hardworking people. So, and I thank the church for all their support for them in the past. God, in your continued grace and mercy, hear our prayer. Friends, we now pause in silence to hold those prayers which we have not given voice to today. God, in your grace and mercy, hear our prayer. And let us now conclude with the prayer for peace, saying, O loving God, spirit of hope and peace, lead us from death to life, Lead us from falsehood to truth. Lead us from despair to hope, from fear to trust. Lead us from hate to love, from war to peace. Let peace fill our hearts, our world, our universe. Peace, peace, peace. Amen, amen, alleluia, amen. God be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. And lift them up to God. And let us give thanks to God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. For you, Creator God, the valleys laugh and sing, and the trees of the fields clap their hands. Your earth summons us to break silence and be one with the song of creation. We give, we give thanks. thanks. For you, God of all, the church in its myriad forms and countless languages honors its savior. Millions upon millions invite us to be one with them in the drama of worship. We give you thanks and praise. In heaven beyond our seeing, the angels and saints are caught up in song, and those we have loved and lost are part of that great company. They call us to be one with the harmony of heaven. We give you thanks and praise. So gladly we join our voices to those of earth, sky, and sea in the universal hymn of praise which echoes through time and eternity. Holy, holy, holy God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We remember today that in his last meal with his friends, Jesus used that time to create a new way of remembering him and his teachings and his life with them. During the supper, he took a loaf of bread, gave thanks for it, and broke it. And when he did that, he said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. As often as you eat it, 
remember me. In the same way, when the supper was over, Jesus took one more cup of wine, blessed it, gave thanks for it, and gave it to the disciples saying, take and drink. This is my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, remember me. Let us pray. Holy God, triune God, bless these gifts of the field and the vine. Use them to transform us from the inside out to be your holy people, blessing your holy world. We pray for your blessings now and your spirit to move among us. Amen. So you should have a, um, one of these guys. The way to open it is first there's like a thinner decorative clear plastic and so you open the, that first and if you don't there's no way to get your um, wafer. So we have the wafer. I'm going to set mine down here real quick. And then careful of the couch cushions, the pew cushions I should say. The body of Christ for your healing and wholeness. The blood of Christ for your wholeness and renewal. Thanks be to God. Brother Jesus, we have been guests at your table. Come with us wherever we go and be present in all that we share. Someone whom you have fed in generosity of spirit to ensure that all the hungry are nourished at earth's barren places are fertile. Come with food, faith, hope, and love. Amen. together. 
May the God who is our creator, the Christ who is our brother, and the Holy Spirit who moves with us always go with you now. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the, the love, love of God, God and, and the companionship of the Holy Spirit be with us all and evermore. Amen. Amen.